Um, some of you may wonder what I've got in this bottle. It's not rosé wine, by the way. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with a, uh, surprisingly perhaps, a verse from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And this is from the English Standard Version. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. don't know if you've read... Um, the book of Daniel, you know, obviously we've read the uh, Daniel and the lion's den and all the fiery furnace. We've been taught those stories from uh, being children. But I wonder if you've read the whole of the book of Daniel through uh, the later part uh, uh, becomes um, really quite um, profoundly visional. And there's a lot of prophetic stuff in there. But if you read uh, in Daniel 10 and uh, through to 12, you will see that uh, there's mention of national angels. This is uh, Daniel uh, 10, verse 12. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the king of Persia. Well, Daniel is talking about human, a human king, but he's also talking about princes. And these princes that he's talking about, Michael, one of the chief princes, a lot of people have believed that this was the archangel Michael, and uh, that each nation has its own prince, because the prince of the kingdom of Persia, for example, uh, withstood me 21 days. Well, we're not quite exactly sure what that means. There must have been something going on in Persia at the same time that there was something going on in Babylon, where Daniel was. To cut a long story short, it actually gives us insight into something about the spiritual forces that are going on and the battle that's going on in the spiritual realm that affects our current physical realm. I hope that's not too confusing uh, an introduction. But the, the Bible hints at the fact that, you know, this is not the only reality. Well, you know, we know that's the case. We, we talk about heaven, don't we? But, uh, you know, in the um, creeds, we talk, we say things like, I believe in or we believe in all things seen and unseen. That there is an unseen spiritual world that has an impact uh, on our present physical uh, reality in our own spiritual lives. Some weeks ago, I came home from a meeting and turned the TV on. And the England were playing a, a World Cup qualifier football match, I think. The fans were singing, rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves, Britons never, never, never shall be slaves. And I thought, really? We certainly don't rule the waves anymore. What's to stop us being beaten into slavery as Hitler wanted to do? 
to us in 1914. You know, I think those war years, when our nation was on its knees, in a practical sense, was the last time it was spiritually, truly on its knees. And large numbers of people flocked back to church because they feared about the future and about our nation. And there was a lot of talk at the time about us being under judgment. That people flocked to church, mainly women, it has to be said, but also uh, uh, men who were not in the forces went to church and they pleaded to the Lord for help. In the 1970s, a Christian singing duo, um, Malcolm and Alwyn, those of you who've been around a long time will probably remember them. Uh, uh, they, in one of their records, one of their albums, produced uh, a song that not many people remember, but I do, because I think it was a really prophetic song uh, about England. And we're going to play the song and put the lyrics up on the screen uh, at the moment. It's called England Goodbye. And I want you to follow these lyrics and hear what it is that they're, that they're saying uh, in this song. These two, Malcolm and Alwyn, um, interestingly enough, uh, came from the sal same Salvation Army Corps that Philippa's mum was brought up in Mansfield in Nottinghamshire. That's right, isn't it? it well, it is. It is. The, it is. And... Um, uh, so they were Salvationists, um, but it didn't look like Salvationists because they both had long hair when I, when I uh, remember them from the 1970s. They didn't have uniforms on either. Um, but uh, uh, this song is a... I, I, we're going to play it now so we can hear it. Um, Alwyn Waugh and Malcolm Wilde. <laughs> the writing's on the Wild Wall. The writing's on the wall, which is actually from the book of Daniel. Mene, mene, tekel, parson, and where the Lord writes on the wall. Uh, uh, and it's a, 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 the Lord is writing on the wall of our country. We have our own uh, spiritual prince. I don't know if we know his name, but uh, uh, what I mean is not Jesus. I mean that there are, spirit, there are angels. There is a, uh, an, an angel delegated to our nation. And, of course, the Lord wants to bring his message to us. I hope this is not too... Uh, up there for you, but I think in reality we need to know that the Lord is at work uh, through his mighty power in our time. When I think of you, you're beautiful and green, they sing, but somehow you've turned to grey and I see you've lost your way like a lover who's unfaithful to his bride. I wonder if you can see why I thought of this song when thinking about the, the message of the prophet o Isaiah. Because just as uh, the people of Israel had lost their way and had been unfaithful to, to God, there is a sense in which our nation has become unfaithful. And uh, there is a sense in which, uh, you know, I think this is a really powerful critique uh, that Malcolm and Alwyn have written, uh, saying, you know, that people have lost their first love. They've lost... Uh, there, as a nation, we, you know, we were once a very, very Christian nation. I think everybody went to church. Of course, that was never the case. But there was a huge proportion of the population that once were worshipping uh, regularly in ordinary parish churches up and down the country, faithfully believing in a God who would answer their prayers, a God who would guide and lead them who would teach them how to live in a way that honoured God. Britannia, rule Britannia. Britannia rules the waves. Can we have our pennies up on the screen? I need to come and look at them, actually. First one, if I don't know if you can... S oh, no, we haven't got it there yet. Um, Britannia, of course, was the personification of Britain. You know, this... Uh, uh, um, picture of Britannia or something like it has been around since the first century. The Romans uh, uh, used it. Um, and it's a female personification of our uh, nation. And in this coin from 
1799, from, from uh, halfway through the 18th century, this uh, appeared on British pennies right up to the time of decimalization, and then it got transferred uh, to the 50p piece until 2008, I think. Um, but Britannia is the sort of, you know, it's it, the person personification of our nation. And if we go on to the next one, you see there she's offering the piece, uh, the dove of, uh, she's offering the, 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 the olive branch on the first one uh, there. And here, uh, Britain, you know, on, on sitting on the, the flag, and you see the lighthouse and the sea, seafaring nation. We went around the world, we took the gospel with us. And of course, literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people went out uh, proclaiming the gospel to the world. And actually, Britain was one of the main uh, agencies of the gospel being spread around the world. There's no denying that. Uh, you know, British culture, sometimes we, we do ourselves down as a nation. You know, every time I watch sport on the television, tennis. Who invented tennis? The British. Who invented cricket? The British. Who invented golf? The Scottish. Who invented rugby? The British. Who invented the modern Olympiad? The British. And it goes on and on and on that we actually took those things with us, but we also took the gospel with us. How come is it that we are now at an all-time low with, I have to say, other religions taking over? How long it will it be before Islam claims to be the national religion of this land? Now, powerful as Malcolm and Alwyn's prophetic song is as a critique, I don't believe that the Lord has given up on England. I believe like Israel, we are like a daughter or a bride in exile. I believe that things have come in and have taken over the resolve of the church. I think the church has been steered in wrong directions by people who don't want to let God have an intervention in their lives or in their church or in their leadership. You know, bishops who don't believe in God, when you get people writing books like Honest to God in the 1950s and all that idea that God is dead. When I was a, a youngster, um, we had a, a mission, a tent mission, um, uh, come to a village not far away from us, and we went to this tent mission, but it was welcomed warmly by uh, the vicar. Um, who had been brought up in the generation to, that was uh, taught in college to believe actually that God is dead and that Christianity is all about really sanctified social work. And he encountered God in a really powerful way and he wrote a simple song. God's not dead, he is alive. God's not dead, he is alive. Do you know this song? God's not dead. He is alive. I feel it in my head. I feel it in my arms. And I feel it all over me. Yeah. This is a man who believed that God was dead, but then he encountered the real God. And I think that we've had generations of this stuff that's eroded away at people's confidence in the real, true, and living God that, that they believed it. And as a nation, that's really deeply affected us. I think there are deep parallels between us as a leading Christian nation in our past and the situation of Israel and Judah that found themselves in at the time of Hosea. As I said uh, the other day, I think, sometimes people label Hosea as a prophet of doom. I wonder, have they got to the end and read chapters 11 and 12? I don't know if you've read them, but I think that they indicate that Hosea is a prophet of hope. That God is in the business of calling back his wayward people. We read in 
chapter 3, we, um, we hear that God's plan is to act to save his people and to restore them. And our history as a Christian nation was a part of that restoration in the past, in history, to draw people to himself. Of course, Israel was taken into exile by Assyria and later Judah by Babylon. But people returned. And it's among those people who returned that Jesus came. Israel is, as I think I've said already, fulfilled and restored through him. And we are grafted into that restored Israel. Now, chapter 11 of Hosea is stunning, really. It's beautiful. The poem depicts God as a loving father who raised his son Israel and then shared everything with him. And the son grew up and rebelled and turned on the father, taking advantage of his generosity. And so in this poem, God is emotionally torn apart. And you wonder where Jesus got the parable uh, of the lost son from. He read the prophet. And he interprets it in a way for us to know that when we go away, however far we've gone away, however far our nation has gone away, that that nation, when it's brought to its knees, will return. When, our, when the people of our nation are, as it were, feeding swine and are hungry enough to eat the food that they're feeding to the swine, then perhaps their pride will be crushed and that they will return to the Lord who alone can save them. In Hosea 11, one moment he's angry and naturally he says he's going to bring severe consequences, but the next moment he's heartbroken. And he says through the prophet that he's moved by his mercy and his compassion and he's going to forgive the son he loves he says, how can I give you up, Ephraim, Israel? My heart churns inside of me. All of my compassion is aroused. And so while God did allow Israel to be conquered by Assyria and to face the consequences of its sin, that's not God's final word. There's still hope. And that's what the last chapter is about. Chapter 12, Hosea calls Israel to repent and turn back to their God. But he knows that it won't last because it never has before. And God says that one day he will heal their waywardness and love them freely. And God goes on to describe how this new healed Israel, the, one, the Israel finally healed, is a lush tree that will grow deep roots and broad branches and offer shade and fruit to all the nations. You know, Jesus in the New Testament talks he points to a mustard tree that comes from a tiny seed. The tiny seed presumably is him with the kingdom of God shared among his disciples. And it grows into this mighty tree, does this mustard seed. And it's, he says uh, into this mighty tree, the birds of the air will come and rest. I wonder if you know who the birds of the air are. The birds of the air in ancient culture are us, the Gentiles. And we come and rest in this tree, this kingdom that God is, has instituted. And he's instituted it most powerfully through his son. Really, God himself come into the world in human form. Bringing the kingdom of God, bringing the rule of God in to the world. The rule that transforms the world. And we're in this period now, what we call the last times. The last times is not, you know, three or four weeks before the second coming. Uh, the last times is the time between Jesus' ascension into heaven and his return. So the last times has been going on for 2,000 years or thereabouts. And there are spiritual battles going on in that time. And we know that the 
that there is this spiritual battle going on with unseen things. And those unseen things speak through people and people are led astray sometimes by those people. But when the prince of our nation sent from God stirs up uh, preachers and churches to again proclaim the gospel of salvation, then the tide, I think, of our nation's history will change. And I've, you know, I've been struggling in how to express this, this to you because it sounds so... Oh, you know, there are lots of dots in Scripture. How do you join them uh, together? But I think the message of Isaiah is applicable to us today, where so many people, generations, we, you know, people are four, five, six generations away from, uh, from understanding the Christian faith. Um, most, of, most people in our nation were taught the Scriptures in school. 19... Uh, um, 69 when I went to secondary school um, Northamptonshire Education Committee gave every child in our school a copy of the Revised Standard Version of the Bible I've still got mine somewhere um, and uh, it, it, that was amazing that the state sponsored people to read the word of God you know, how far have we come from that now We've come a long way, but it's not too far. Hosea calls Israel to repent and turn back to their God, but he knows uh, that that won't it last entirely because you know they've gone their own way again and again. But of course, he's at work. Today, through the regenerated Israel. And I believe that God wants to be at work in us to repair the deep brokenness and the sinful selfishness of the human heart. So that God's people can receive his love and love him in return. This is what God promises to do. After the last poem in Hosea concludes, and we find the very last words of the book, they're like a note uh, added at the end by the person who compiled these teachings of Hosea. And uh, he says, Who is wise and discerning to understand all this? In other words, Hosea's poems. My, 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 how we need the spiritual gift of discernment uh, in the church. Somebody said to me many, many years ago, Glenn, seek the spiritual gifts, but as a pastor, you must seek the gift of spiritual discernment, most of all. And I think that uh, to an extent that's true. Uh, we need to be discerning on what is going on in our midst. And I know that some of you are deeply spiritually discerning and prayerful about what is happening in our nation. And uh, Hosea says, uh, or rather the author says at the end there, the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the rebellious stumble in them. So the author wants us to know that Hosea's ancient poetry to northern Israel is not locked in the past. It's not just for those people who lived in 700 and something BC. It's not just for them. It reveals deep truth about God's character and purposes and human, and human nature as well. It reveals our responses or lack of response to him. While God should and does bring justice on human e evil, his ultimate purpose, his heart, is to heal and save his people. That's what the book of Hosea is all about. It's about God's desire to woo his people and to bring healing and restoration to them. Rule Britannia. Britannia rules the waves. I don't know about you, but I rather get the impression nowadays that people, they're almost enjoying the fact that we're laid low. I don't know if you... I, 
uh, uh, the, our daughters who quite enjoy watching the Eurovision Song Contest every year. And I sort of know we're going to become last. We're going to be virtually last. Because, uh, you know, nobody wants to vote for us. It's almost as if they see this once great nation on its knees and, oh no, we don't like them anymore. But I, as somebody who believes in the mission of God to this nation, you know, we've sent missionaries overseas in the past. We call them mission partners nowadays. We're not allowed to call them missionaries. But I think we need a big mission here. And I think the people of God need to be the first to point people back to God and to say that God longs for you to return. I don't think we need to be lacking confidence in this. I think that we can actually say the Lord wants to know you. We can actually go up to people and say that. Let's have confidence in the God who changes things, in the God who heals and restores, in the God who makes himself known. Because certainly there are plenty of people uh, in our world who know their need and their fallenness and their, their needs for salvation. And the only way they can find that, they might seek in other ways, they might seek through other religions. You know, um, that song I introduced you to uh, when we first came here. Oh Lord, I love your word. You know this. Oh Lord, I love your word. It is life. It is health. It is food for my soul. Oh Lord, I love your word. Bryn Howarth, who wrote it, uh, He's probably one of the best rock musicians that's not become famous. Uh, Pink Floyd wanted him to play on their record, The Wall. And he refused, saying, I'm not just another brick in the wall. This was after he'd become a Christian. And he realized that he was cherished and loved by God, one of, of God's uh, beloved. And the story about how Bryn and Sally Howarth came to faith <laughs> is absolutely Stunning, and in a lot of his songs, he writes about the state they were in uh, before they came to faith. There's a, there's a song called The Gap, uh, where he says, I, I tried drugs, I tried drink, um, I tried food, I got fat. Uh, um, there's this hole in my life. And then he realized so much that he needed something. They tried all sorts of things. Eastern religions, meditation, uh, and so on, and actually art. And uh, he was quite into painting. And uh, one day he sat down with an easel and he painted a picture of a circus tent with, I think, blue and white stripes on it. That's right, isn't it? Blue and white stripes on this circus tent. A visionary picture, as it turns out, because not soon afterwards, not long afterwards, they were driving along and they saw this tent. That's my tent, said Bryn. And they stopped and they went into the tent and it was a tent mission. And Sally so much wanted to run to the front when the appeal came, she nearly ripped Bryn's arm off. But they both went to the front. And somebody said, what do you want? And they said, we need him. You see, the God of visions, the God, the the God of the spiritual battle in the heavenly realm, can give people dreams and visions. And we've been talking, haven't we, about the Muslims having visions of Christ. Well, we need to see people who are... Uh, seeking at the end of their tether they've, they've filled their life with everything else we need to see them having visions that will lead them to the place where they can hear the good news of Jesus and perhaps we need to be praying for people of Bushmead to be having visions about our church do you remember um, that uh, film the one with do 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 yeah, Close Encounters of the Third Time. 
uh, you know, I, I don't know if you remember that film, if you've ever seen it, but one of the guys in it, he, 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 he can't stop drawing pictures and making models of this mountain place. And, it, it, and he goes there, and eventually they encounter these aliens. Well, I think, you know, that, that's a fiction thing, of course. But I think that God will give people visions that will cause them to come to the place where the gospel is proclaimed. Because he wants to woo our nation back. And our part in that is to be those who are discerning, who will speak to people <coughs> as they come with their longings, their yearnings, their visions. Do you understand what I'm talking about, people? Do you understand that we are in a time when we will need to be spiritually tuned in as the Lord draws people back to himself? I think that's all I've got to say. Let's stand.